thanks for, I don't know if you say coming out, or I guess you say thanks for joining in um, on our August Zoom meeting. Um, I talked to Bayland today and just let them know that until they hear otherwise, we'll probably be not attending meetings in person. And he didn't sound surprised at all. So I'm sure a lot of other organizations are doing the same kind of thing that we are. Um, so this is usually where the meeting and person we would ask if there's any visitors. And I know there's a few there that are I would consider visitors. So if uh, Barry, if you want to say anything, introduce yourself at all, that'd be great. I just got the audio on so I can hear you. Uh, Barry Klein, we live out in Eugene, Oregon. And I met Dennis, didn't actually meet Dennis, just have talked to him online. Uh, we have some common dive friends. And uh, so I was in the Philippines right before he got there this last year. So he invited me to join in and I like to shoot with a snoot. So I just wanted to hear what you guys say. Okay, well, good. Well, thanks for coming. <laughs> how's yeah, how's, thank how's you the guys. weather in Eugene, hot and dry? Yes, it is actually. Yeah. We've had like uh, in the 90s here, which is our hot time of year, but uh, no rain for weeks. So kind of unusual. Yeah, ours. We've had rain every day for last week. So we'll send some of your way. Um, yeah, shifted. Now, especially, I know we talked about you earlier. I don't know if you have a mic. If you want to say hello or not, I'm not sure who you are. Can you, can you guys hear me? Yeah, we can. Yes. Oh, okay. I didn't know. I didn't think yeah, I had this thing hooked up. Good. I'm Al who Friedman. Are you? I'm Al Friedman. Oh, Mel. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Hey, Al. Yes. Nice to see you. I didn't know. I was listening to the whole meeting. I didn't think you guys could pick me up. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Can introduce yourself. America. Al Friedman. Yeah. This is my first Zoom meeting. Good. Well, thanks okay. for coming. I know I talked to you before at the meeting. Oh, yeah. So well, glad to. Glad fact, to have Joe, I don't know if Joe told you, Joe and I are going to Socorro Islands. There's still one room left if anyone else wants to go. There's availability for Christmas week. Huh. So, oh, you know which Joe? Else? We got several. Joe, Joe Hawes. Hawes. Joe Hawes. Okay. Yeah, he just said he was going. Sounds like a trip. Okay, anybody else a visitor on there? Who's okay. Jim CA? Oh, Jim CA, who is that? Jim Carmel, he's litter fan. Aha. Oh, hey. <laughs> Hi, Jim. Hey, John. All right. Well, thanks for coming out, everybody. Um, mm -hmm. Next question we usually ask in the meeting is, has anybody been diving? Has anybody been lately <laughs> since the last month? <laughs> I didn't expect a whole lot, but OK. <laughs> we'll go on from there. Um, Russell, you want to say anything about the British Virgin Islands trip? Um, I'd rather wait till September because of the fact that I don't know what's going to happen right now after seeing what the Cayman uh, phase one was. Uh, and I've been told to just kind of wait and see. Uh, I'll make probably a better announce or I'll make an announcement in September. Nothing's really changed. Uh, they're still not open. They're supposed to open September the 1st or 2nd, but I don't know if they're going to do a phase one, two, three, like Cayman's doing or not but they seem to look to Cayman before they do something. Although the USBI is open. Um, <laughs> I yeah, know. I have a friend going there next week. Yeah, I mean, it, it's open, and um, but the BVI is not. So uh, I'll report something more in September. I'll have talked to a dive BVI by then, and we'll go from there. OK, appreciate it. Thank you, Russell. Um, Kathy, are you still on here? I can talk. I don't know. Yeah, do you want to? Yeah, do you want to go ahead and do you want to go ahead and a few minutes ago about what's going on there in the Hups October on air trip? Okay. So Gary and I, John and his wife, are signed up to go. Tonight's the last night to put down your money, and um, so United is flying the supposedly the first Saturday of October now. And uh, Bonaire is supposed to decide the end of August whether we'll be allowed in, which is about the time that we have to pay the money to Captain Don's. So uh, we're still probably 50-50 of being able to go, 
uh, have a friend from the Netherlands that is down there right now having a lovely time. So it is possible for some of the world. Okay. Well, we'll see what happens. I guess a lot of this is going to be stay tuned. Exactly. Uh, well, thanks for that. And let me, I guess, Betsy, you want to talk about a few things? All I want to do is just remind everybody that they need to have their um, fall video contest entry in to me by October 1st. And we'll show those, uh, we'll vote the entire month of uh, October and show all of the films at the uh, PUPS uh, November meeting and uh, show the winners. That's it. Hey, Betsy, what about Huff? Uh, the announcement in the newsletter wasn't correct uh, yeah. this time. It didn't get updated for some reason, but uh, uh, it's, it's still saying that we're having the Huff uh, in September, and we had a unanimous committee meeting that said that was not in the cards. And so I have an email out to Cassandra asking her for uh, dates in April, April uh, 17 and 18, I think. It's, it's Friday and Saturday. Um, almost a year to the day from when we would have had it, if she gives us the dates, so we don't know. Yeah, another one of those. Stay tuned, and we'll see. And I, I remember we had the meeting about rescheduling Huff, and we had considered rescheduling to May or something. It's like, yeah, this <laughs> May, past May. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that definitely was not in the, in the cards. Yeah. Um, in case, like Barry or, or uh, Jim, if y'all don't know, HUP is a Houston Underwater Film Festival that HUPS is putting on. And so that's what we're talking about to reschedule for next spring. Um, San Diego, anybody um, oh. David, just one other thing. The San Diego Festival has announced that uh, they're going to be virtual this year. Okay. I don't it normally takes place in October, the first weekend yeah. in October. Right. I, don't, I don't know. Uh, yeah. How they're going to pull that off, you know. Well, I mean, I guess you could have a Zoom meeting with eight or nine hundred people. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it would have been nice. It was la It was really good last year. I enjoyed that trip. Well, we'll do it in 2021. The date October 2021. Yeah, crazy. <laughs> All right. Um, anybody else have any announcements? Nope. All right, Dennis, all you. Okay, well, am I coming through okay? Yes. Okay, good. Well, we have a real nice program tonight. We have uh, a new presenter to, um, uh, not new to Hops, but certainly he's never done a presentation. Uh, he has uh, participated in some other presentations that we've given. Uh, Joe Haas is, um, he works for the Shell Research uh, Company uh, for 39 years, and um, uh, he went to school at San Jack, <clears throat> and he's uh, been diving a few years. I guess you would call him a rogue diver. He was, he started diving in 1957, finally decided to get certified in 1994. That's uh, it's a little bit... Uh, long time before between starting and getting certified Joe <laughs> but anyway <clears throat> I knew uh, Joe Diver uh, as a diver when we went to Palau and uh, Yap and that was about what about five or six years ago I don't remember the exact date the thing that I remember about Joe on that one was is that he is the only person I've ever known that has been <laughs> successful at getting a video of mating mandarin fish. And not only did he get it, but he nailed it. It was absolutely gorgeous. But anyway, we had a good time. And Joe, uh, for the last three years, has been involved with uh, helping disadvantaged divers get um, in the water and enjoying the experience. Uh, he's made numerous trips back and forth to Dallas uh, to, to work with the uh, 
uh, adaptable and dive heart organizations. And that's what he's going to be speaking to us about tonight. His, uh, pro the program and his involvement with it. Anyway, I will introduce Joe and let him take it away. And then when David comes on, I'll in get him, um, give him a, his uh, introduction. Thank you, Dennis. I appreciate that. Uh, get closer to your mic, Joe. Get you closer to your mic. Get closer. If I get closer to it, then I'll be eating the screen. <laughs> okay, here we go. I'll just speak up. All right. So this may be a little bit of operator malfunction, but we'll give it a shot. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to show is just a TED talk that was given a few years back that gives uh, a, a basic background to the to the whole thing. Uh, we can take questions at the end of it, and then once we get into the other part of the questions, uh, I'm sorry, the other part of the presentation, if anybody has any questions or whatever, we'll handle that as we go. It might be easier if we save them for after each segment. Uh, that way we don't get too many people trying to speak at once or the way it usually goes with questions nobody trying to speak so let me see if i can get this to work <clears throat> and there is some volume here in a little bit all right, all right, everyone, get ready to imagine the possibilities. I'd like you all to close your eyes. Really, close your eyes. Trust me, it, it's okay. I'm going to take you on a little journey. I want you to imagine that you're at the top of a ski hill and that I'm guiding you down the hill. Ready? Left turn. Good, good. Right turn. Excellent. Feeling the snow fall from beneath your skis. Great, feel the wind in your face. Imagine the trust that you must have in me to guide you down the hill because you see you're blind. You can open your eyes. My daughter's blind from birth. Um, she got to be about nine years old. They mainstreamed her with sighted children. The sighted kids teased her on the playground because her eyes darted back and forth. And she, she came home and she said, Dad, she said, I'm not blind. She goes, I can read. And she could. She could read a letter about two inches from her face. And she said, you know, I'm like everyone else. I'm not blind. And she threw down her cane and refused to learn Braille. And the teachers are going, Jim, this kid's got to learn Braille. She's going to get through school. And I'm like, what am I going to do well, with her? Well, I was at WGN Radio at the time, and, at the time, and one of the announcers said, there said, Jim, I'm going to hook you up with a blind ski group. And after a couple, and after a couple weeks, my daughter was going to school. And, and they said, would you do this weekend, Aaron? And she said, well, I went skiing. And they're like, right, you went skiing. You're blind. How do you do that? And she went, no, here's the pictures. And they're like, oh, my God, that is so cool. You're blind and you ski. How do you do that? And she's like, yeah, I'm blind and I ski. <laughs> you know, I'm pretty cool. Immediately, Immediately I, saw I saw the confidence, independence, and self-esteem come to my daughter, and it, and it was really the skiing that did it. It created a paradigm shift in her life. Now it wasn't Aaron the blind kid anymore. It was Aaron the skier. She felt she could go on and, and challenge things that she had never done before. So she went on and excelled in grade school, middle school, high school, uh, won awards, got scholarships, and uh, I blame it all on the skiing. What really, really impressed me was uh, when I was at GN, some of my friends said, Jim, you know, I, I was always afraid to take on this challenge of my life until I saw your blind daughter skiing. And they said, you know what? If she can ski and she's blind, you know, I can do this. And I said, wow, this is really powerful. I go, look at the ripple effect. Here's a little blind girl, right, who's skiing. And she's affected this guy who really kind of hardly even knows her. I started scuba diving uh, in college. I thought I was a journalism major. I thought if I ever meet someone like Jacques Cousteau, I better know how to scuba dive, right? So when I, I'll never forget the first time I got in the water and I'm, I'm hovering between, between the ceiling and, or between the, the surface of the water and between the bottom of the pool. And, and I'm like, oh my God, this is like being an astronaut. And so we call it our astronaut moment. And every time we get someone in the water, we, uh, we do that. I'd like to introduce you to uh, one of our divers, his name is John. 
John is a C5 quadriplegic, so he has a cervical injury in his spine. You can see his hands, um, there's not a lot he can do with them, but John can feel from his elbows up. Now imagine if you're in a chair every day, right? What we wanted to do is we wanted to help John escape gravity. So we took him down to Cozumel, Mexico. This is John the first time out of his chair, right, other than being transferred to bed and experiencing zero gravity. Now it takes me the better part of a week to get a blind skier really acclimated to the ski hill, feeling the, the fall line and knowing how to initiate turns. But in about 15 minutes, I can get John using his breath as a balancing act basically to experience his astronaut moment. Now the cool thing about this trip was after about the second day, John came up to me with two other veterans with spinal cord injuries and said, you know, Jim, we've been in chronic pain for years. And they said, this is the first time we've been pain, all three of them, first time we've been pain free since our injury. And if that had been the first time someone said that to me, I'd have said, oh my God, that's incredible. But I just said, get in line. Because if we can get you deep enough and we can teach you how to use your breathing, doctors from John Hopkins went with one of our teams down to the Cayman Islands and found there's an extra output of serotonin at three atmospheres, which is about 66 feet underwater. So the way I view this, this is a potential pain, pain management tool. Now, now imagine if we could take someone like John and get him out of his wheelchair on a regular basis. You know, one of the guys was pain-free as long as three weeks. Right? Three weeks. So imagine if you can get into the water every week. You might be pain-free all the time, right? This is a, another one of our divers. This is Mike. Mike said, you know, Jim, I don't know if I can dive. He said, I can't swim. And I said, that's okay. You don't have to, you don't have to be able to swim. So here's a guy who's never swam in his life. After about 15 minutes teaching him how to use his breathing and control his buoyancy, we helped him experience his astronaut moment, right? Of course, after that, he's a slave to gravity like the rest of us. It reminds me of a Vietnam veteran who was in a wheelchair who came up to me and he said, Jim, you know, he goes, I served my country. And he says, men now, they look down at me. And, and some of them talk to me like I'm a child, you know, where it's easy enough to take a knee and talk to somebody eye to eye. But he said, you know what? When I'm underwater, he said, I look those guys right in the eye. It's a great equalizer. Individuals like John and Mike had traumatic injuries. What happens with the traumatic injury we found is that individuals are no longer the, 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 the man or woman that they were. A lot of guys coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan, they've suffered loss, okay? Some of them have even given up. Some other individuals we work with, like Jessica, now they're born with a disability. Now Jessica was born with no arms. But you can see her here, imagine, for those of you that are divers, she's assembled all her gear on her own with her feet. Here she is experiencing her first astronaut moment, using her breath to control her buoyancy in a pool. Then we took her to the quarry and we got her out there and she assembled everything, she did everything. She removed her BC, she, she, she uh, removed and replaced her mask, she recovered her regulator. She could even put her contacts in with her feet. Yeah. The only thing she said, Jim, you know, the only thing I can't do is I can't do a ponytail. I go, I'm not going to be able to help you there. <laughs> but the smiles, the smiles that we get from doing this are incredible over and over again. And the heavy lifting that we do, it's not about going to the Caribbean. You know, the heavy lifting we do is in pools all over the world. We've done programs in 200 cities around the US, in China, Australia, Israel, the UK, and all over the Caribbean. And we find the same thing. 15 to 20 minutes in the water, we get them out of the water, and it's created a paradigm shift. And the beauty about social media that we found out is basically that we can take photos and video. And now, Johnny, who is in a wheelchair, right? Now Johnny's a scuba diver. And if Johnny never gets in the water again, he's got that identity change. He looks at himself differently and takes on other challenges in his life. And other people look at him differently. 
He rolls into a party or a family function. They say, what did you do this weekend, John? Oh, I, I was scuba diving. Right. You have a traumatic brain injury. You have no legs and you're blind. And he goes, yeah, check out my Facebook page, right? <laughs> we know now Facebook is where we need to focus, right? Anna, Anna took, gave me a, t a tour of the Shriners Hospital where she was care coordinator. And uh, we're going through the halls and one of her workers, uh, co-workers come up and she says, gives her a hard time and Anna says, what? she says, what do you know? She goes, you're a tabby. And I go, tabby? I go, what's a tabby? I've never heard that before. She goes, temporarily able-bodied individual. I think now every time I look in a mirror, <laughs> temporarily able-bodied individual, that's all of us, right? But Anna was, was uh, born with no arms and no legs, well-adjusted, first time in the water. We're right there with her, we control her. Then we decide to take Anna to Bonaire and give her an astronaut moment in the ocean. And with, with a team of, of highly trained individuals, instructors and dive masters, we're able to take her in the water and give her an experience that, that she may never, never ever have had before or may ever have again. But now, Anna is equal, right? I mean, in this photograph, if you did, if you, you'd have to look hard to see that she has no arms and no legs because she's, she's eye level and she's equal with her peers. And then, of course, the goal is to take her from the pool, right, where we do the heavy lifting, and then, and then get her out there and, and give her that astronaut moment and give her independence. And with the current, just like with John, the very first diver that you saw, who swam the length of three football fields underwater, only being able to use the little bit of movement that he had, okay, now she, with the help of the current, is able to move through the water independently as well. So this has led us to some very exciting things. Um, We've taken on challenges, and with tools like full face masks, we've been able to take individuals who would never have a chance to do this before and get them in the water and have them experience this. Um, this woman, Erica, is uh, blind and deaf. Basically, you know Helen Keller, right? This is Helen Keller. And I said, well, how am I going to teach a blind and deaf woman? And I reached out to one of our divers who was blind, a blind Vietnam veteran, Rick. And Rick, I asked Rick, I said, Rick, can you learn to tactily sign to Erica? And he says, he says, yeah, absolutely. And so what we did is we got acclimated, and then we put a full face mask on Rick, and then we, I wore a full face mask, and I communicated to him by pushing a button, just like, just like the military or, or rescue divers do to talk underwater. And then he would tactily sign to Erica, and then Erica would sign back to him, and he would talk to me. And I, so we had a, a communications protocol worked out. So it's, it's innovative. It's it's. It allows her to change her life because now we take her to Cozumel, Mexico, and she shows this picture to somebody and goes, yeah, I was diving at 70 feet on a wreck in Cozumel. And people are like, sure you were. Uh, oh, yeah, check out my Facebook page, right? So it's all about imagining the possibilities. I, we believe what we've seen so far, just anecdotally, and I'm not a therapist and I'm not a doctor, but what we've seen anecdotally, uh, we believe will revolutionize rehabilitation. This young man is floating without gear on, he has a 20-foot hose. But imagine his therapist. Now, he has a spinal cord injury from birth. Imagine his therapist being able to say, okay, Johnny, let's work on range of motion, right? We're doing research right now with Duke University Medical Center. We just finished the, the world's first study on autism in scuba therapy. Autism, right? It's an epidemic. And, and kids with autism take to it like that. It's amazing. You know, pressure is a therapy if you know any, anyone with autism. All right, they, wear, they wear pressure vests. They wear, uh, have weighted blankets. Well, diving is inherently, you know, the pressure increases as you go down. And that's why the, the top hyperbaric physicians in the world from Duke University Medical Center are interested in doing stuff with us. We're searching right now for veterans with traumatic brain injuries to do another research study, uh, University of, um, or the uh, Illinois School of Psychology, again, an IRB to do research. So we believe there's 100 years of research in front of us. We believe this is going to revolutionize rehabilitation. Imagine physical therapy in a zero-gravity environment, right? It's inherently hyperbaric. You go down, pressure increases. We know there's an extra output of serotonin when you get to depth. The doctors from Hopkins, you know, prove that. This is another one of our divers. This is uh, Connor, again, experiencing his, his astronaut moment. You can see Connor, is, uh, Connor would never have an opportunity to do this if we weren't working in a zero-gravity environment. And, and with, with the help of our instructors and divers, we're able to, um, 
to assist him. Now this is probably our most extreme diver. This is Matt Johnson. Matt uh, is on a ventilator, right? Imagine being on a respirator. You can't breathe for yourself. But with the help of technology, we were able to get a custom dry suit manufacturer to put a port into the side where the, the ventilator provided air and then it went up on the inside to his trach, right? We use a dry suit which seals off water, okay? And then we use a full face mask that protects the airway there. Matt's able to go underwater 15 feet because that's as long as his hose goes. But University, uh, Northwestern University engineering students have actually developed a prototype that we asked them to do when they did a, a program for us, a project for us, to find out if we could bring him deeper and basically take an underwater camera housing and put his ventilator in there with a bunch of scuba stuff hooked up to it. And, and they did it. So we just need money for the prototype and that'll, uh, we'll be able to do that. Our vision is... We, we know we need deep water, but most of the water is, is not accessible, okay? Less than 1% of the people in the world dive, okay? And the reason for that is most of the water is cold and dark. So what our goal is, is to build a 100 to 130 foot deep pool here in the western suburbs. You know, we're a little nonprofit from Downers Grove, Illinois, but we're changing the world. And if we can build a 130-foot pool here where we can start taking people in 90-something degree water and doing, and doing therapy, imagine the researchers that will come, right? This is, uh, this is in the Aquarium of the Pacific where we've taken divers. Actually, I'm in there with Alex. Alex is a C5 quadriplegic. And, um, but, and the lady in front you can see is signing. And we have probably a thousand people with disabilities in the audience watching this. But this is showing, showing them exactly what we can do with this, uh, possi possibly. Imagine therapists behind a, a glass window looking, looking at, uh, at loved ones or patients or therapeutic techniques where, where now they can use zero gravity. And really, I mean, there's a whole, a whole, a whole future of, of, of therapeutic exercises that, that haven't even been developed yet in zero gravity. We kind of got ahead of, uh, ahead of the curve a little bit on this. And in 2010, we, uh, we had Perkins and Will and, and some other folks that helped us out and put together a, um, a proposal for a 40-foot deep facility. And, and this is that. And we brought it to the VA at Heinz. And, and it got kind of hung up in Washington. Everybody locally loved it. But we, I'm so glad it didn't happen because we realized we don't need 40 feet. We need, we need probably a, at least 100 feet. So our goal is to build a multi-million dollar facility here in Chicagoland's western suburbs to help with research, rehabilitation, education, training, and to provide vocational opportunities for individuals of all abilities. This is a to scale photo of what the inside of that facility would look like. You can imagine taking people of all abilities, bring them in in a zero depth entry and then have them work uh, at different levels with different gases, 100% oxygen, enriched air, and see what kind of therapy comes out of it. So I guess to summarize this, we, um, we're at the very tip of the iceberg. You know, just when you think there's something or nothing new under the sun, you find something like this. It's almost like being in a, in a laboratory and you accidentally discover Velcro. You go, oh my God, that is so cool. You know, how'd we do that? And, and you know, I, I left the media business after 30 years to, uh, to embark on this mission. And, and now I'm a volunteer. I don't draw a salary doing this. And I'm, I'm happy to do that to build confidence, independence, and self-esteem in people with disabilities. But I found that now this is, this is actually a therapy. And I think, you know, with, with people's help from around the world, I think that we can help people with disabilities uh, imagine the possibilities in their life. Thank you. Joe, you're muted. You need to unmute by pushing the space bar. Okay. Does anybody have any questions on that presentation? I do. Okay. 
can any of the effects that he talked about with having them under pressure be gotten from going into a hyperbaric chamber? Yes, uh, the, the hyperbaric chamber would, would do basically the same thing, but it's much easier to try to do physical therapy or things like that when you're not in a confined environment like you would be in a hyperbaric chamber. But it'd be, it'd be basically the same, same results. You'd need to take them down at a depth greater than about 66 feet or the equivalent of three atmospheres. Okay. Hey, Joe. This is Dennis. Have they been able to, uh, how long ago did they make that movie? That's been several years ago. Uh, so there's a lot has actually changed since then, but that was one of the few things that I could find that gave a, a somewhat of a background. It was actually given to people who weren't familiar with diving and that's why a lot of it was rather simplistic. Do you know whether or not they were successful in getting their uh, funding for the 130 foot uh, chamber? They're still working on that. Uh, it, it's hung up, surprise, surprise, with politics. Oh, I, I forgot to mention that uh, that presenter was Jim Elliott, who is the founder and the CEO of Dive Heart. And, uh, he doesn't draw a salary. Uh, matter of fact, virtually everybody is volunteers. There's a handful of paid staff uh, there in Downers Grove in uh, Illinois, but mostly it's volunteers. Okay, well, if we're done with questions, let me move on to the next portion. And this might even be more clumsy. <laughs> Okay, um, <clears throat> this is basically just a slideshow using, uh, uh, okay, I've lost the word, PowerPoint. And I will go through it. There's a couple of attached videos as well. Uh, hopefully everybody won't get too terribly bored. So let me go to the beginning. The Dive Heart Mantra of Imagine the Possibilities has been encouraging children, veterans, and others with disabilities to focus on what they can do instead of what they can't do since 2001. Through years of experience in pioneering adaptive scuba innovations with individuals for a wide variety of disabilities, Dive Heart has introduced scuba therapy to thousands of individuals in hundreds of cities around the world. It's through this experience and the discovery of the physical, psychological, emotional, and spiritual benefits found in scuba therapy that Dive Heart conceptualized the vision of building the world's first deep water facility for research, rehabilitation, education, training, and to provide vocational opportunities for individuals of all abilities in zero gravity. About 56.7 million people, or 19% of the entire population, had a disability in 2010. Given this statistic, it's easy to imagine that each of us knows someone dealing with an acquired or congenital disability. Dive Heart exists to serve as many people as we can within this group. The news story highlights, uh, this news story highlights some of the benefits of scuba therapy for people with disabilities. And this is from CNN, great big story on pain management. Uh-oh, operator malfunction again. So far? Tammy, you're muted. Uh, we've uh, lost your uh, your presentation. Uh oh crap! Can you see me? Yes, we see you. All right, let me try the share screen again. Oh. 
Okay. That does it. Oh, phooey. All right, are we back? Yes, I can see your screen. Okay. All right, uh, moving right along. We engage in six main activities to help us fulfill our mission. Education and outreach. We bring the message of hope and healing with scuba therapy through presentation to clubs, service organizations, support groups, medical conferences, and so forth. Dive Heart Scuba Experience events and programs offer free pool pr programs for people with disabilities to experience the freedom found in and under the water. With the adaptive training, we train and certify adaptive instructors, adaptive dive buddies who help people with disabilities in the water as well as training and certifying adaptive divers. The life-changing adaptive scuba trips, Dive Heart, offers, Dive Heart offers opportunities for our adaptive divers and adaptive buddies to dive together in open water. These environments around the world throughout the year. Dive Heart also assists participants who may need help with funding. Research, we partner with researchers at university medical centers to further research on scuba therapy and the benefits it may provide to people with various disabilities and conditions. The Dive Heart facility that they, we've already been speaking of, uh, so I will skip that part of it since a lot of this is rather repetitive. Hey, Joe, are you trying to show the PowerPoint? Because that's not what I'm seeing. I'm just seeing a browser window, not your PowerPoint. Uh-oh. All right. Let me... I, I assume up. everybody else is just seeing a browser window? Yeah, I just oh, see, I see, see a dive. dive. It says yeah. Dive Heart Needed Scuba Assistant Assessment. That's all I see. Looks like a PDF to me. Okay. Joe, maybe just unshare, open share screen again. Well, for some reason, it's not. Let me stop sharing and then share again. Try sharing your screen rather than the app. Green button at the bottom and center. Yeah, for some reason it's, it doesn't seem to want to do that. Okay, we have your uh, PC screen on right now with its icon. Okay, is the is the PowerPoint back up? Yep. Not not okay. yet. Yeah, I, you I got, got it. it. Okay. This is certainly going smoothly. I'm impressed. <laughs> Keep going, Joe. You're doing fine. Okay. All right. At Dive Heart, we believe that sharing our main many stories of hope and healing not only helps create awareness, awareness about the benefits of scuba therapy, it addresses a variety of ways that scuba therapy benefits the body, mind, and spirit of the participants. Researchers have found that everything from the physical benefits of chronic pain relief to the psychological and emotional benefits of increased confidence, independence, and self-esteem have been realized through scuba therapy. Even the alleviation of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms, have been experienced by participants while diving. Individuals with autism spectrum disorder have also seen increases in socialization and have gained the sense of accomplishment and self-esteem as well as clarity of thought. Whether you're a participant, volunteer, donor, friend of Dive Heart, you just can't help feeling a sense of satisfaction and accomplishment after supporting or participating in, in a dive hard activity. Dive Heart's also an adaptive scuba training agency. 
Through this agency, Dive Heart has developed a specialized training for people who have a disability but cannot earn a standard diving agency certification. This is called the Adaptive Diver. Those who want to assist people with disabilities in the water, buddies and advanced buddies, and instructors who want to teach both adaptive divers and adaptive dive buddies. Just as an FYI, I'm an advanced adaptive dive buddy. So Joe, did they have a program here for that since he was in Illinois? The, the closest program is one in Fort Worth. Uh, it's actually a, a sort of an offshoot of Dive Heart called Adaptable. Now, Dive Heart has been pushing me for about the last two years to start a, a group here in Houston. And I told them I would be more than glad to help with that, but that I'm not taking on the responsibility for it because I've seen how much is involved in doing that. Okay. Um, Dive Heart hosts multiple domestic and international trips throughout the year. These are, are to give our adaptive divers and adaptive buddies opportunities for safe, fun experiences in open water. Some of the recent trips are to Key Largo, Florida, Cozumel, Indonesia, Roatan, Cayman Brac, and Bonaire. And there's many others as well. Uh, this video captures the essence of what we do, highlighting the aspect of freedom and the fact that people do not have to be defined by their disabilities. Suddenly it's quiet. The only sound is of the bubbles. And every now and then, if you blessed, you'll hear a dolphin or a whale. The strongest people I've ever met are disabled, and these people live lives and, and, and go through difficulties that we can't imagine. We take them down below, and people have walked for the first time in 30 years, and some of them in their entire life. So it's, it's amazing. See you in there, guys. Dive Heart's a nonprofit, a 501c3 that I founded in 2001 to help people with disabilities through scuba therapy. One, two, three. Zero gravity is, is a lot like the environment on the moon. So once we trim them out and get them neutrally buoyant, they're completely weightless and their breath controls their up and down movement. That's a sweet spot. That's the astronaut moment. Some of the, the doctors and researchers that have gone on trips have found that there's an extra output of serotonin in the human body at 66 feet underwater, that's three atmospheres. That helps with pain management, alleviates PTSD symptoms, and we've had people who have had chronic pain who are pain-free for up to three weeks when we get them deep enough. That's the key. For me, it, what it feels like is a feeling of uh, comfort and relaxation because I think in my case, all, all the pain goes away. And just all of a sudden, you feel like everything's fine. It's an equalizing force for the able-bodied and disabled people. When you put them all in the, in the water together, everybody's pretty much equal. It's a total freedom. It's, I leave my wheelchair up on the boat. I just love it. It's, I get to see all the fish, the coral. It's a whole different world down there. I have a cardiovascular workout that I can't really get in a wheelchair. It feels like I'm flying. Christina is my best friend. She has cerebral palsy, so making everything barrier-free and accessible for people has always been really important to me. Seeing the joy in people's faces when they come up after the first dive, after they're seeing something that they never knew was possible, is just out of this world. They are constrained and confined to their wheelchair. You want to go diving? Yeah! When we take them diving, um, there's a certain look that I see in their eyes. I know what freedom is about. I'm, I am now empowered. I'll get back into that chair, but I know now there's some other things in life that I can do. 
And what we believe at Dive Heart is that people with disabilities represent an unrealized human potential. Plus you're building that self-esteem and confidence and it's very cool. I mean, if you're in a wheelchair and you can scuba dive, you roll into a party and you got something cool to talk about. And, and that cool factor is, is no small thing. It, it, it creates an identity and then they start believing in themselves. And, and that's what it's all about really, is to have hope. Yeah, we're seeing you, Joe. Operator malfunction again. This might be a good point. Uh, it's not actually part of the presentation, but just to give a brief idea of, of how it works. Um, for every adaptive diver, that's someone with a disability, whatever it might be, at a minimum requires two people in the water with them. Typically, you have one person in the back that will hold on to the tank valve and act as a motor if they aren't able to propel themselves and as a safety in case there's something going wrong. This person also can help with uh, buoyancy or, or whatever or to avoid obstacles. Watch out for where their legs are in case you're going across coral or whatever to make sure that they're, they're up off the coral. And then you have a person who's in front that is basically most of the time swimming backwards looking at them to see their eyes, see what's going on, communicate with them, let them know what's going on, and depending on what their level of need is to assist whatever way necessary. And I've got another form that we'll go through real quickly and uh, it will show some of that. So let me try to continue on here. So Joe, do you do both? Front oh, and, yeah. and top? And what? Uh, are you both, uh, do you have a uh, specific thing that you do? Uh, like, do you guide them or do you monitor them? Oh, actually, I, I do do both. That's, that's uh, with the advanced adaptive dive buddy, you're authorized to do both things. You, you also can lead the, the group. We're now seeing the PowerPoint presentation on the share okay. care. All right, the dive art presentation at Ground Rounds, Grand Rounds events to physicians, professors, and others in the medical field, like these leading hyper hyperbaric physicians at Duke University Medical Center, have continued since 2001 to help foster adaptive scuba as a therapy for people with all abilities around the world. Dive Heart Military Wounded has served veterans and active member, military members since 2001 at VA hospitals, military bases, and veteran service organizations around the country. Dive Heart has helped facilitate the first study of autism and scuba therapy with Midwestern University and almost one out of 60 young people diagnosed on the autism spectrum. This is the frontline therapy that can change many lives. Dive Heart facilitated, facilitated research with university medical centers around the country helped grow the possibility of helping people of all abilities through scuba therapy, both phys physical and cognitive. Dive Heart is planning, the, well, we don't need to go into that. We've, we've beat that one to death. Uh, this is just about the, the Dive Heart facility again.
Air Navy corpsmen come together with dive heart volunteers, adaptive instructors, and Marines with disabilities to give to give value and purpose to anyone who gets the dive heart adaptive dive scuba experience. Okay, so that's that's all for the PowerPoint presentation. Does anybody have any questions about that? Hey Joe, hey, this is Russell. Have you ever tried to use the NASA pool? It's like uh, no, we haven't yet, but that's because we haven't done anything in the Houston area yet. Okay. Uh, it's it's mostly been working up in the Fort Worth area, and one of the pools that we use there is with the Boy Scouts, and then another bigger inside pool as at the Joint Naval Reserve Base there in Fort Worth. Yeah, and how many people ask that is because that pool is like 40 feet deep or maybe even be deeper than that. I couldn't hear you, Russell. The only reason I asked that is because that NASA pool is about 40 feet or, or deeper. Okay. Yeah. I'm afraid that would be a lot of, uh, stuff to go through, but it's certainly worth considering. It doesn't get used all the time either. That's, that's the reason I was asking you. Right. Yeah, typically uh, we just do a weekend, uh, quite often over a long weekend, uh, especially if there's training involved, uh, and we're almost always doing training. You had a question, Tammy? Yeah, how many people do you need on the boat per participant? We need a minimum of two people for every participant. And so on the boat or on the water? Yes, either way. Now, quite often we will have extra people on the boat just to help. Uh, the most difficult time is getting on and off the boat. Yeah. Because quite often you're having to lift them in their chair onto the boat. And of course the boat's bouncing up and down mm -hmm. and you're trying to get as many people as you can around there to help lift. And surprise, surprise, some people are kind of heavy. <laughs> Hey, Joe, I was kind of surprised that they would uh, uh, schedule some of their trips into Cozumel because of all the current and uh, surge and things that you get there. The surge hasn't really been a problem, and the current actually helps because for people who aren't able to swim very well or at all, the current lets you just drift by. Uh, we try to do the dive sites to places that don't have a lot of current, but have enough current that they don't have to swim very much. Hey Joe, it's Craig here. Have, have you seen the uh, elevator that uh, they, they put on the Odyssey in Truck Lagoon for divers to get in and out of the water? No, I haven't seen that. Yeah, it's a vertical uh, platform that uh, goes up and down off the back deck. It's, it looks like it'd be perfect for you guys. You just I mean, I loved it. You just go and stand on the thing and it just lowers you right down into the water and the same coming back up. Uh, yeah. So well, as you saw in the, in the video, we typically lift them onto the, the, uh, the dive platform gear up there and they, they, they just do a front roll into the, into the water. And you usually have a, at least a couple of people there to catch them, get them upright roll them on their back so that they can see and uh, make sure that you get positively buoyant. Yeah, hey, okay. another question. Uh, have you guys considered doing any kind of like certification uh, where people could kind of leave the nest and go off and, and maybe dive places on their own? I, I know it, these, these people require a couple of extra dive masters, but you know, some parts of the world, that's not too expensive a thing to do, you know? Yeah, as a matter of fact, there, there is an adaptive diver certification. And then there are different levels of the adaptive diver certification depending on the level of need. You know, and mostly that defines what type of people you need assisting you and how many it requires. As we dove with a guy in uh, Triton Bay, I mean, is remote places you could possibly go and uh, he he had had polio uh, you know he was Spanish and had polio before the vaccine was available 
So he was on crutches all the time, had almost no use of his legs. And he went out diving with us and had a camera just like ours. Uh, he just had a, you know, like a lanyard that kept it around his neck, had no use of his fins whatsoever. But he didn't, he didn't need any help except getting in and out of the water. He had uh, gloves that were like those web gloves that you were showing. And he didn't, he didn't like a lot of current for sure. But uh, I mean, he was taking some totally, you know, unbelievable photos. Uh, <laughs> so what people can do is pretty amazing, actually. Yeah, it, it's it's amazing to me what all can be done. Uh, one of the guys that was in the training class that I was in when I first got certified with them uh, was in a wheelchair as a quadriplegic, and he could outrun me. So you know, it, it it's just it's just amazing. He he went on after the certification there to become a a, uh, a paddy dive master. So, you know, there's, there's somewhat no limitation. There are several different certifying agencies now. I believe Patty has an adaptive diver certification and SSI does as well. And they're all somewhat based on the dive heart uh, requirements. Typically the, the thing for the adaptive dive buddy is a dive heart requires in the field experience before you actually get your certification, and a lot of the other ones don't. It's just mostly classroom and, and uh, practice sessions. Hey, Joe, I know that uh, uh, Pee Wee uh, Rodney has one of those uh, scuba scooters underwater. Yeah. Um, yeah, that they can use, just hop on it and it takes them wherever they want to. Uh, people with um, use of their hands could probably use something like that as an adaptive diver. Is that correct? I would think so. I haven't encountered that yet. Uh, I, I I would imagine they they don't want to do that because that could get you too far away from the boat in case or something goes wonky. Uh, you know, typically our dives aren't all that long. They're on the order of forty minutes or so even though everybody's got plenty of air, uh, but it's mostly so that folks don't get tired out and you don't want to be too far away from the boat in case there's an issue. Hey Dennis, there was a consideration on the uh, underwater scooters, the single prop versions, people that don't have control of the, don't have use of their legs have trouble because of the torque reaction from the prop. Nowadays, they're making the uh, dual props. That wouldn't be so much of an issue. Uh, that's that's interesting, uh, Wrinkle. Well, I think okay. that, that would kind of just encourage dependence on another piece of machinery rather than the whole idea of them being independent in the water. Well, that's, that's one of the things that we strive for the most. And you may have noticed it in most of the videos, the, the adaptive diver was on their own and that's the goal is to is to get everything in in position get them properly weighted properly trimmed so that they can do stuff on their own and then if necessary we can help you know for example quite often it seems like the boat drops you off too far away from where you're actually supposed to be and that's mostly because it takes us a long time to get folks in the water and they they start off in the right position and the boat drifts and then by the time we're in the water, we're a long way from the dive site. So that's, that's when we'll have one or maybe even two people hanging onto their tank and, and helping propel them to get to where the good stuff is. I would imagine that there's a whole spectrum of, well, I know there's a whole spectrum of disabilities all the way from quadriplegics to people that have lost just their legs. And so the, uh, the solutions for each one would be custom made, I guess. Well, that's, that's a really good point, And that leads me into my next part of the presentation. Boy, you Just like wanted to help there, Joe. <laughs> okay. 
this is just a form and I'll go through it really quickly, but it's called the Needed Scuba Assistance Assessment, or we call it just the NSA. And basically it is how we determine how much help each individual needs. And we do this assessment with each one of them and review it every time on a new, on a new dive trip. Uh, I'll scroll down here. These are some of the requirements of documents that are needed. You need to have a medical statement, a clearance from your physician, adaptive diver participant agreement, and a medical authorization. You might notice that most of that's all medical. And that's you know, obvious because of the, the needs that they have. The, the main role of this document is to determine what level of, of assistance they might need. The scoring system, if they score higher than a 25, then they require a different dive team helping them than if they score less than a 25. And these are all uh, many of the categories and on each one of them, you check which box it is and these points on the side, are you able to see the mouse? Yes. 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 Yeah. So, uh, on, on each one of these, you'll see that there are point scores. And in actuality, if any one of these first four items, they are unable to do those, that automatically puts them into a higher category to where then they need at least a, a minimum of two adaptive bi dive buddies, one of which has to be advanced or higher. So you can just scan through here and see some of the, the various things you know, for example, transfers, if they're unable to get in and out of the boat by themselves, then you'd get a point for that. If sometimes they do, you get a half a point and so forth. Uh, we can just go through here really quick. Uh, so the, the bottom line though, it is that we go through this big long assessment with, uh, with each diver and then wind up giving them the score. This score obviously changes with any change in their health. You know, they might get better, they might get a little worse. You know, whatever the case is, we, we constantly reevaluate. And this is the composition of the dive team. An ADT, an adaptive dive team, is just two certified adaptive dive buddies for all diving activities. If you have a score higher than 25, or regardless of NSA score, if the diver does not able to, uh, is not able to do control descents and descents, equalization, out of air emergency alternatives, or if they need a full face mask, it requires an adaptive, ad try again, advanced adaptive dive team. And that requires at least one advanced adaptive dive buddy and one ad 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 adaptive dive buddy. And then quite often we will add a third person just as a, an observer and to help out if necessary. If they require any special equipment in addition to any of that, then it becomes an advanced adaptive dive team plus. And that just you know says that, uh, for example, if someone uh, has a cognitive issue and has to have a therapist or caregiver with them, that becomes the plus person or if they require any specific adaptive uh, equipment, uh, you know, like a full face mask or uh, anything like that. And this is just some of the possible adaptive dive gear required, the full face mask. Has anybody, well, that's probably too much of an open question. Uh, for those of you that haven't dived with a full face mask, it can be quite an adventure too, because as it as it states, the entire face is open. Uh, I mean, in, enclosed in the in the mask, and then there are several straps that tighten it down on the face. Uh, it has a regulator in the front, but it's slightly different in that it maintains a positive pressure in the mask at all times, and that way it it helps keep the mask clear and it makes it to where it doesn't take on water unless something really major happens. And then you can also have a full face mask with 
communications equipment. And then there's things like prosthetic fins, special glasses or prescriptive masks, customized wetsuits, you know, that kind of stuff. And then if, if, there, if necessary, you have a cognitive or psychological information if there's any issues with that. Uh, you know, if someone uh, doesn't like to be touched or uh, has trouble being close with somebody or, you know, easily gets upset or disturbed, uh, you know, uh, quite often people with autism would, would fall into that category. Okay. So that's, that's all of the form. Uh, I've got one other thing to show, which is just a, a, a photo, which I thought people might, might enjoy. This is the size of the group that was in Cozumel, Mexico, uh, 2019, I think. If you'll notice, most everybody has on uh, a black, shirt with a red heart on it and across the, the heart says dieheart.org which is how you can get to them. If you notice one of the only odd man out is me in the white shirt and the reason I'm wearing a white shirt is that that's for dive heart wounded veterans. Okay um, I think that's all I have which I realize I've taken a lot of time and sort of dragged on forever. But if anybody has any other questions, perhaps? No, I Are y'all located it was quite... in Louisiana? I'm sorry, what about Louisiana? Are you located in Louisiana? I don't believe there are any in Louisiana that I know of. The only ones that I know of right offhand <coughs> excuse me, are in Illinois, Florida, Fort Worth, and uh, Seattle, Washington, that are in the U.S. And like I say, they're, they're pushing real hard to try to get one started here. So if anybody wants to volunteer. <laughs> so that's some pretty expensive gear you're talking about there. Um, did they get financial aid? Do you have financial aid to do things like the full face masks and communication and all that sort of stuff? No, uh, most all of the, the it, it's a 501c3 and it's virtually all on donations. I think they may get some funding from the, uh, the feds, but I'm not involved in that part of it. So I don't really know. I know uh, some of you guys donated stuff that I then donated to Dive Heart. Uh, wetsuits and things like that and uh, they either use the wetsuits directly if they're in good shape and, and people can use them or they cut them up and and make them into uh, can you guys see that is that too they, oh, they yeah. make they make uh, wetsuit coasters out of them <laughs> Joe on that form that you use to um, determine what they need. Yes, ma'am. Do you do that before they ever go in the water or is this a continuous thing as you see how they're progressing? Both of those. Uh, it's done before we ever get in the water, even in a pool. We go through an evaluation just to, to make sure that everything is, is okay. And then we update it uh, before we ever get in the water on a dive trip. We go through the NSA and, and there's also a, a personal sheet for that diver. Uh, the main thing on it is what their proper weighting is so that we don't have to go through that whole process of figuring mm -hmm. it out again. Uh, and it even goes down to where you attach trim weights and, and so forth, you know, that you might wanna have ankle weights. It may require uh, a weight on the tank valve. Uh, you may have to clip uh, weights up on the top of the, of the BC on the D-rings whatever it takes to get them trimmed out in the water. But yes, it, it's, it's reevaluated all the time. I think we're gonna probably need to move along. I'm looking at the time here. 
we got yeah, enough to get David and the contest. And I think that uh, if we have some more questions, maybe at the end, uh, Joe can respond to them at that point. But um, I hope everybody's hearing me. Are you hearing yeah. me? Yeah. 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 Okay, good. Uh, David has been our, uh, he's been helping on presentations uh, for a number of years. Um, and I asked him to see if he could come up with a little bit of uh, a workshop presentation on something that he's been doing recently uh, with snoot photography, which is one of those really neat buzz things that uh, have come up in the last, what, five, six years? Seems like it's gaining momentum, people with uh, directed lighting that uh, allows them to focus light just on the subject itself. Uh, I met David even before uh, I, I guess I wasn't even certified at the time when you were still working at Micromotion and we borrowed your uh, uh, ski place up in, in the uh, Keystone area. But uh, he has been a member of HUPS since the late 90s. And um, I've always enjoyed being around him and seeing his work. And I'm going to let him uh, take the show now. Okay, good. Enough of that. <laughs> Um, can I go ahead and share the screen here? What do y'all see? Snoots. Snoots. Full yeah. screen? Full screen snoots. There we go. How about that? Um, yes, can, yes. can y'all see me over here? Yep. Okay. All right. Yep. I, it's hard to talk without being able to show things or do the hand motions. Anyway, snoots, here we go. What is a snoot? Uh, basically, it's a device added to a light source to limit the angle of the light emitted from that light source. So you can use it on a flashlight, a strobe, what have you. They can be purchased items, or they can be homemade, custom-made creations of PVC pipe or funnels. I think Dennis has an awesome funnel project that he for Analog that didn't quite work out. <laughs> Old wetsuit arms or pretty much anything. Um, why use a snoot? Basically, they allow the photographer to light only the subject. So it really makes it stand out from the surroundings, okay? Um, if you have distracting elements in the foreground or background of the image, they can be left black and uh, just have that light only on your subject or even just particular parts of your subject. Um, limiting where the light goes will also minimize backscatter. So you can kind of use a, not exactly the device I'm going to show you tonight, but you can use the idea of a snoot for wide angle even, because if you're shooting the reef on a wall, there's no reason to put light on all that open blue water, right? You're just asking for a backscatter. So by limiting where that flash goes, you can help reduce that backscatter challenge. Um, snoots open up the possibility for creative lighting, like a backlighting. You see a lot of backlighting these days and imagery, and uh, that's easily done, or more easily done anyways with snoots. And um, so I mentioned there, they can be used for macro as well as wide angle. But like I said, not the snoot I'm showing you today is not for wide angle. Um, so this is a regular image of a cuttlefish. Uh, no snoot involved here. This is the same cuttlefish, same algae background with the snoot. So you see it's a lot more moody image, mm. um, maybe a little more mysterious. Um, so. It Depends on what you know your taste is. You want to see the environment, or you want to have a little more artistic shading, just highlighting your subject only. Uh, another example: um, this is a blue ring octopus. This is actually a shot on a night dive, but you wouldn't know that by the highly illuminated background there. Um, this is also a snoot with two strobes, and then a similar subject, not the same one, but similar size and everything. Um, with and this one actually has a day dive and so it has a black background whereas the night dive had a really illuminated background and that's because and this one I'm snoot and I will say it was pretty lucky that snoot illuminated to highlight the octopus as it made a jump from one rock to another so another subject example 
I think this is an Anbon scorpion fish maybe. Um, obviously no snoot and same subject with the snoot. So again, a totally different look and feel to the image. Um, when I was in Analyle, which is the only trip I've done with this new strobe I'm going to show you all tonight, new snoot, um, I dove with my two regular strobes on the camera housing and I also had the strobe with the snoot mounted on the housing. I could do both setups for different subjects and that's why I have some of these comparison shots. So as I mentioned, you can buy snoots. These are a couple different examples, you know, and they're not exactly cheap. The one, two on the left, you know, they're plastic tubes or funnels. The one on the right is the Retro LSD, it's called, light shaping device. And that's a bit more extensive. It has a lens inside and everything. Uh, but being a cheapskate, you know, I thought, heck, I can make a snoot, it's just a funnel or a So I tried a couple different versions. Um, the PVC masterpiece on the left. And then I think my daughter or ordered a funnel, a collapsible funnel for the kitchen. And the one she got was green, you know, and I was, this fits my strobe. I tried it on my CNC strobe and it fit perfectly, you know, stretched right across the front. And I, you know, tried it out a little bit with the green one and it seemed to kind of work. So I ordered a three dollars on Amazon or something but it didn't work either and I'll tell you why my creations didn't work uh, this is the front of my strobes uh, it's a CNC YSD2 and you see at the top there that little circle is the modeling light and, and then the actual flash tube is a big wreck middle and you would think shining that light through the funnel that the modeling light or the flash tube would all be lined up the same but they're not so if I have my modeling light shining through the funnel on my subject, when the flash was off, it would be offset from that. So it was very challenging to get the, the uh, snoot my subject. And on top of that, the amount of light that would come out of the funnel or the PVC pipe even from the modeling light was so reduced it made it really challenging to see it. Um, so anyways, I don't have any shots to share with those snoots because they did not work. So then, uh, I don't know, maybe back in November or something, I saw Backscatter advertising their new creation, which is called the Mini Flash. And um, I thought that's what I need. So literally within a few days of it being announced, it wasn't even available yet. I ordered one, I pre-ordered it, because uh, I was hoping I'd get it before I went to the Philippines at the end of January. And I did get it plenty of time for that. So I was very happy about that. Um, it, it's actually two components, it's the flash and the snoot, and you can buy them separately or you can buy them together. I think if you buy them together, it's like $50 discount. Uh, let's see. So it's a flash and snoot, they're designed from day one to be used together. Most of the other snoots are all like an afterthought to go onto an existing strobe, whereas this was all designed uh, at the same time. <laughs> so it's a very bright aiming light, LED aiming light, um, and it shows the exact area that the flash will illuminate. So when you're using that aiming light to get it on your subject, you know that's where your flash is going to hit also. Um, there are circular and oval aperture cards. I have a, oh, it, it's invisible. There we go. <laughs> this is one of the little aperture cards that slides into this. So anyways, um, they can change the size of the light that's coming out of the snoot. And they also can change the shape because like I said, you have circular and oval mm -hmm. shapes. Uh, Backscatter claims it to be the smallest, brightest, easiest to use strobe and snoot combo available. And I, I, I have to say, I believe it. Um, it was pretty easy to get used to and start using. The shape is very different than anything you're used to as far as a strobe goes, but it seems to work quite well. It seems to be a fiber optic cable. It has six power settings. Power settings for the aiming light. Uh, if you're used to or want to shoot TTL, it will not do that, straight manual only. So I just say I love my um, Backscatter Mini Flash. I'm really happy with it. Um, Backscatter.com has a bunch of different videos on the technical information on the strobe and snoot, and also on how to use it. And the details on how to use it on the videos are really, really well done. So if you're considering getting one of these, definitely go watch all those videos. 
Um, again, here are the mini flash aperture cards. And so these are just easily changeable and movable. So if you have a different size subject, you can just adjust your light to fit the subject. This is just a couple of examples here I've put together. Um, this is a snoot about four inches from the ruler and it's changing the aperture. So it's going from about less than an inch in width to maybe say an inch and a half to about two inches in width. And so um, it just sort of showing how easy it is to flip through those different sizes of light. And if you really want to go small, if you have a tiny subject or want to highlight only a tiny part of the subject, um, by going to the smallest aperture and getting close, uh, you can get it down to about a quarter inch wide beam of light. And so that would be like just the rhinophores of a nudibranch or something, you know, very, very small that you could highlight. So my suggestion in choosing the aperture, the size of your beam is, is to go small. If, if you go real big, it's just kind of goofy looking, like a spotlight or something. And the other thing I noticed is like if you're shooting down on something, it makes this big, you know, spotlight circle, which I personally don't care for. Um, you know, sometimes, okay, that circle, but, you know, if you really want to get in closer, use a smaller light, I think it's interesting. Like I said, a little bit of mystery there. Um, sweet spots. Okay, so snoot strobes have optimal working distances. If the snoot is too close or too far from the subject, be diffused or even split into two. Uh, at one point, I remember one of my subjects, I don't remember what it was, I think it was a team little nudie brand. I was getting really close to it. When I got so close, I would see the light do this. And I kept looking in front of my camera thinking there was a piece of coral hanging down or something light. But uh, in reality, that's what happens when you move in super close. It can break the light into two, basically. Um, personal taste will dictate if you want a softer edge to the light or a harder edge, sharper edge to the light. And I'll show you what I mean in a second. Um, the back, Scatter mini flash sweet spot distance will vary depending on the aperture car being used. Um, like I said, my test I did on that green ruler were about four inches away. Underwater, I think the working distance is a little more uh, than in the air. So here's what I'm talking about. If you look on the right side, you see the light is a really sharp edge to it. And then on the left, it's a little softer edge. And you can make it a lot softer edge too, but again, by moving in and out. Okay? But there's that certain distance that you're at, it'll make that edge really, really sharp. So if you want maybe more drama or something, maybe that would be beneficial for your image, that sharp edge. So by having this extra device that can be really tricky to aim, um, there are a lot of different ways that you can handle that. Um, you know, I did some research on it. Some people use them handheld um, because it's very flexible. To, you can aim it wherever you want to go. And I say it's best for divers with three hands because, you know, you got to have one can holding your hand holding your camera, <laughs> have one holding your strobe, maybe you need another one for doing who knows what, right? So it, it can be kind of challenging, I think, to totally hand hold the, the strobe and snoot. Um, some people put them on a small tripod, like a, one of those gorilla pods, you know, and uh, put it in the sand, aim it down at their subject. Uh, once they get it positioned, they can change their position of the camera without changing that light. So that can have, or you can mount it on a strobe arm. And it's kind of a compromise of the two options above. Um, you want to put your snoot on the strobe arm on the left side of the housing because your right side, your hand is having to hold your camera, right? So you have your left hand able to move that snoot around while it's mounted to your housing. Um, you know, I suggest leave the arms a little loose and make easy adjustments of that snoot position. As I mentioned earlier, when I was using the snoot, I had my two regular strobes mounted on the right and left side, and then I had the snoot and flash mounted on the cold shoe of my housing, so that little flat plate kind of mount on the top of the housing. And uh, I would keep the arm pretty loose, and I would just use my left hand to move it around while I was trying to frame it all up. Because, let's see, okay. So I'm gonna get in to talk about this. And if you have questions, feel free to interrupt. I'm going kind of fast because we still got to get the contest in and everything. But if you don't be shy, if you have a question. Hey, David, uh, it's Craig. How do you get uh, three fiber optic uh, things hooked up? Oh, I, good question. 
I have to unplug one of my strobes and plug, plug in the fiber optic for the snoot. Usually what I would do is I would dive and just shoot the regular strobes, but then when I find a subject I thought was suitable for the snoot, I would pop one of the plugs on my strobe and then plug that fiber optics connector for the snoot in at that time. And there were a few yeah, times they, I plug things back in and out, so it has, takes a little extra thought. But, um, and then once I usually had the snoot going, I would leave it on for a while, find other stuff that would fit the snoot. But at the beginning of the dive, at least, I would usually just have the two strobes um, wired up. Okay. Yeah, David, so, this is Dennis. I had a question. Yeah. Uh, I borrowed one from Mike Bardick while we were over there. Right. And uh, I noticed that at least with my camera, the uh, Olympus, I had to turn the uh, camera off and on and then do a, a, uh, a pre-shot for it to be able to calibrate. Were you finding that to be the issue when you changed from normal strobes to regular strobes? You know, I, I haven't. I know that there's, um, you know, different pre-flashes on different cameras. And the way I have my camera set up, it's shooting straight manual strobe output, and I have it turned down like the one one sixty fourth strobe power. So there's no pre-flash; it's just a single flash, and it always syncs right up. I've never had a problem. Okay, so thanks. it's supposed to learn your pre-flash of your camera. So I'm not sure about why you have to turn it on and off. Um, so the challenge here of using the snoot is that um, if you're using a macro lens, you know, you're looking in a very small area right and you got this snoot that's shining a light in a very small area so a lot of times you go up to your subject and you're looking at your subject but you have no idea where that snoot is right because you can't hit the right spot with that little beam of light and so a lot of times if i'm seeing something i know is probably going to swim away after i take a picture or two of it i would go to a rock and uh, of similar size or focus on an area of similar size and get my snoot lined up and then lock it all down or just hold my hand there and go back to my subject and shoot it. Um, the other option there is just, you know, arrange that in advance and clamp it all down tight so it's not going to move and know that you're limited to shooting, you know, subjects that, that big or whatever you choose. But uh, like I said, it can be challenging if you find the macro lens and trying to get that beam of light in your frame. Okay. That, difficulty I have. Um, and, you know, for stationary stuff, I'll just move in with the aim of light. Um, and I kind of, a lot of times I would look over the top and kind of get an idea where that light was so I know which way I need to move. Like I know the light's aiming above my subject and I get my subject in the viewfinder that I light down a little bit and get it on my subject. So you just kind of need to figure out what will work for you in that regard. Um, I don't know if y'all know this guy, Brett Durand. I don't know, he had a few things posted in Wet Pixel or something a few months back during the coronavirus lockdown. And I, I started looking at some of his videos. He has a lot of good information. And this I thought was a pretty good tip. Um, you're talking about if you're, you're using a snoot and you shoot an image and review it, and then don't touch your shutter to change the autofocus distance again. Just go ahead and move in. And when you get close to where your subject is getting in focus, that snoot should be again. In the proper position. Does that make sense? So don't David? touch that autofocus until you move back in and, and line things up again. Uh, David? Yes. Yeah, I, we did a, a class in, and that was actually in Port Valera and another place with Brent, and uh, we've dealt with him in Analog oh, yeah. before. Okay. And um, that's the back button focus is the good part of that. Because okay. once you get your, your back button focus, and you can rock it back and forth and get right. it better. And, just and I set up my retro with just both arms in a triangle. So I had it pointing right over the top. And then you go in and like you're doing, you get your distance, kind of like Mike Bartik does. And he knows exactly where that thing's going to hit uh, in a sweet spot, spot for his focus. And it's a matter of you moving your camera to that point. Right. And snooting. So, so what so I do on a dive like that is I snoot everything. So you're using these? The retro? The retro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And you use two? I like yours better. My wife's going to get yours. I just bring one strobe and I have it set up with a, you know, going up with two arms going up to a, a, a three point uh, clamp. And then I put the strobe right on that three point. So it's set up looking like a tripod over the top of my camera. Okay, so it's like this, just lock yeah, it exactly. Up. So it's exactly. not moving around as much. Yeah, and it's easier to so shoot you can that. Have that out. 
Uh, yeah, I just have it sitting up on top of my camera. I can still okay. use my uh, my uh, focus light. The problem with the retro that I find, I'm using a YSD ones because of the, my trigger uh, flash trigger wouldn't shoot my two, so I traded with a guy. Uh, is that the focus light doesn't always give you a good indication of where you're going to shoot. So it's kind of yeah. a, a trial and error a little bit with it. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's one thing about the backscatter ones. They show you right where that flash is going to go. So it's really I like Barry. Barry, I, Barry I have a question. Those. I have a question, yeah. Barry. About how um, many are uh, of your shots, or percentage of your shots, are you getting it illuminated properly? Well, it's um, once I find the target, I don't have a problem with it at all, Dennis. I didn't ever have to turn my camera on and off. And we were using the same camera uh, in order to use that. Now, I'm using an Aquatica case with a flash trigger. So I don't know what case you have. Um, but with mine, and once I got my strobes to fire properly, which is why I traded for the YSD ones, um, it, I don't have a problem with that at all. Mine is a, a typical thing is finding out exactly where my sweet spot is when I'm aiming it. So I do it like he'd say, get a rock, kind of set myself up. My focus is there, the back button focus. So I know that when I get that subject in focus as I move up on it, if it's focused, I'm in the right spot and I can shoot. Yeah. Dennis, are, well, you, just, are, you, are you, is your camera strobe set to TTL, your built-in flash? You're on mute, Dennis. Dennis, you're muted. Yes, yes, yes. My, uh, I have TTL, uh, but it's not working as well as I would like to with my Nauticam and the uh, Olympus. And, and I think Barry, I may be going to a full wired system. Barry, are you shooting your, you said you had the same camera as this? Yeah, you I shoot manual. That TTL or manual? Manual. Yeah, then it, that's why you're having a sync issue probably because the TTL and pre-flash or something. I, I don't know how it works. I just know that Barry was, I mean, that uh, Mike was aware of the problem and he said, yeah, you just have to waste a shot to make sure that when you're switching from your normal strobes to your snoot, that uh, it has a chance to uh, to learn again. Okay. So, when you want to use a snoot, uh, I wouldn't do it on a high current drift dive. I will say that. So minimal current makes it a lot easier. You know, beach dives are very slow paced dives that will give you extra time to fiddle with it are beneficial, uh, especially when you're just starting out using that snoot. Subjects that won't flee and will allow you to get close or kind of subjects you want to shoot for. Uh, they are night dives, either one's fine. Um, shell dive with full sun may be a little more challenging because it may be a little more difficult to see that uh, aiming light. I didn't have problems with it, but I'm talking about really shallow dives and really clear water. Uh, I could see that possibly being an issue. Um, you know, where to start, you know, higher shutter speeds will keep out the ambient light from, you know, the sun or if it's a night dive, even from your light. So, you know, maybe one, two hundred or faster. I'd say also aperture f16 or so to help with the depth of field and also limit that ambient light from getting in. You know, if you're trying to make things in the background black, you need to limit that ambient light as much as possible. Um, again, start with stationary subjects like nudibranchs, scorpion fish, frogfish, coral polyps, you know, things of that nature. And then, you know, don't get discouraged. If you're having problems with it, problems aiming it, what have you, just keep on working at it. You know, hey, you'll David, end up with more, a lot of shots in the early days like this, you know, cutting off the face, face of the fish, um, you know, the octopus jumping out of the beam of light, um, you know, again, cutting off the face of the fish here, and, you know, missing the aim on the flamboyant cuttlefish. But, you know, if you mess with it a while, you'll get the hang, you'll start getting um, that, you know, make, the, make it worth your hassle of, of dealing with the snoot on your dives. And really, I think that, so I just want to say just snoot it and happy snooting. Um, if anybody has questions, let me know. Um, there are a couple of good links here. This is an older uh, link of the second one there. If you Google up Kerry Wilk and snoot photography, Kerry was one of the early guys that kind of got snoots going. And uh, he has some good instructional information on how to use them and things of that nature. So um, anyways, I just want to encourage everybody, you know, there's a lot of different gadgets and gizmos that come along for underwater photography, and this is one I think is quite worthwhile. Um, if anyone's curious about the size, let me um, stop sharing my screen. How about that? 
I, am I back? Yep. Yes, you're back. Okay, let me get y'all back. So this is um. I know I have. Okay, so this is the. Let me get rid of my virtual background here. None. Okay. This is the uh, strobe and a snoop. And basically it mounts with just a rubber boot. So it feels like a rubber boot, it pops on. So this is a flash. It's quite small. And in case you're wondering, the battery, it's a 18650. It's a lithium ion battery it is. So it's quite powerful, it'll last all day. And then the snoop pops on. And again, this is the aperture card. So very simple little setup. And if you want to use it, the strobe as a regular strobe, you can use it and it also has a little bit of a wider angle diffuser you can put on the front. You know, it's not going to be as powerful as a big mega strobe would be, but um, it'll probably get the job done for most of your photography besides, you know, big wide angle type stuff. But anybody have uh, any David, questions? Yeah, I have one question about uh, your ISO that you were using at, um, 200th of a second and F16 or so. Are you getting yeah. enough light? Um, yeah, I never use this thing level four except to level six. And I don't know if I ever use it above level four. So it gets plenty of light. Okay. Yeah. For the snoot stuff, you're so close that you know I never real I never had to crank my power output up that high. David, they've been holding a lot of classes in Analow, uh, you know, using handheld uh, little narrow beam uh, torches and, and yep. that kind of stuff. Uh, do you have any opinion about like if you wanted to go down this road, you know, it seems to me like that's a pretty, you know, low, low level, low commitment. Uh, yeah, there are some very narrow beam lights that are fairly powerful. And if you look on the reef photo, reef photo video website, they have, um, you know, I was doing this, talk, preparing for this talk, I did a little research and they have a fairly new article just came out maybe in the last couple of months about uh, snoots and they mentioned several of the small flashlights, the real narrow seven, seven degree beam angle and 12 degree angle, um, but yeah. they don't put out that many lumens. So I don't, I don't know. Well, this guy that I mentioned that had polio that was doing, you know, uh -huh. the, the, the photography, had taken one of those courses at Analow and, when, okay. and we, ran, we ran into him on Triton Bay and he was doing all that stuff with this little little narrow beam torch and he was getting some great stuff and you know I don't I wasn't hanging around watching how he was doing it but it was okay. it looked it looked pretty uh low maintenance kind of you know right. you just it looked like you just kind of got the light on the thing with one hand and got your camera with the other hand and took a picture I know Dennis is chomping at the bit to talk about Barry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because I said I was going to tell you to, to hold those thoughts and those questions for uh, next month because Barry Gumbelow is going to be talking exactly about that, uh, about using video and uh, photography using continuous lighting. And I think it's going to be another really dynamic uh, presentation. Uh, he's quite well known around the the diving world for photography and videographer uh, uh, videography uh, he posts um, articles to a number of different publications uh, a good friend of Marty Snyderman apparently yeah, they're he, working on some kind of project he Barry Gumbelay I think that's how you pronounce his name he does a lot of work Gumbelay? on Gumbelay yeah and he said I think he said like the last two years he'd only been using full-time continuous lighting for stills and video. So yeah. that'll be interesting to hear what he has to say. Yeah, well, I met him the first time. He did that for uh, like three years and uh, never got enough red in the uh, <laughs> in the spectrum. So she, so she moved on to strobes. Yeah, so we'll, we'll see how it goes next month. It'll be interesting anyways. Any other questions? Snoop photography or the little mini flash? Nope, okay, well thanks guys so dennis i guess we're ready for the contest well turn it over to martin okay i'll i'll do it let me get it going here
Hey, Martin, you need to stabilize your video. <laughs> Again, seasick. He's holding his breath. Don't bother him. I will mention that we posted the, uh, uh, Craig and I replaced all the video sections that were so crappy in the Zoom presentation and Craig posted it on Facebook okay. and uh, it looks pretty good. Okay. I know both he and I are sick and tired of watching it. <laughs> I think we got three views, Dennis, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> You haven't gone viral yet.
congratulations, everybody. Yeah. <clears throat> there were a lot Wonderful of tweets. Yeah, next, right. next month else? is going to be a next month is going to be a vast wasteland, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> it's never too late. You can go out to the the lake, Clear Lake, and shoot some ambient light photos. <laughs> We'll know which ones are yours, all the brown. <laughs> That's probably what I'm gonna turn in anyway. <laughs> Years ago, I did that. I went to the San Marcos River in the middle of winter because I had no ambient light pictures when digital first started. And so I had to have something to enter in the contest. So I just <laughs> shot some in the river. Now, one of these days I'm gonna actually plan. <laughs> well, they give them to you two years in advance, Dennis, come on. I know. All right, anybody got anything else to share? No, but I, have, coming. I got a question. Can I, can I, do I have to wait until next time to look for a background or can I look <laughs> before I, before I leave? Uh, I, I don't, I mean, Tammy, I don't know. I think you just got to pick one from your computer. Choose virtual background. When you go choose virtual background, do you not see pictures offered as your background from Zoom? On the regular computer? Yeah, when you click on the the lower left, it says stop video. Yeah. And you click that arrow next to it, another window should pop open. And then you click virtual backgrounds. Okay. And then I think there should be some ones that come with Zoom pop up. Do they not? Yeah, they should. When you have right underneath the picture okay. of you whichever, that there's a plus. Whichever one you select, that should be the default one that it uses next time. I'll send you a picture of mine, what it looks like. Okay. Good oh, here, I'll, I'll share my screen. Sorry, guys, if y'all if y'all want to learn this, stick around. If y'all don't, it's okay, y'all can hang up. <laughs> but I thought yeah, you were the Tetons, Dave. In, What's that? In, um, when you open so up I that thought screen, you're the there's a little plus up in the upper right of the virtual backgrounds that lets you add your own. Right. Yeah. Here, I'll, I'll, okay, I see take the screen. Image, but I, but take, I, take the I, how do I get the virtual backgrounds? Just click on virtual black background. Oh, now I can't. Second. David, why don't you take over? I can't share my screen. It won't let me share that screen. Yeah, David, what you'll need to do is take a screenshot of it and then share the screenshot. I think that's the only way. Yeah, I don't know how to do that. Happen. <laughs> I don't know how to do a screenshot on my Mac. Let me see if I can do it. Uh, well, I don't have a camera on this ca on this computer, or I would would do it. Yeah, I'll try it. Yeah, we found a, a a lot of the Zoom features we can't share with the folks at work for that particular reason. Right, I I can't seem to share it. I don't see anything that says Zoom background or anything like that. It just doesn't say it. There's but a little plus. Well, the There's plus, a little you plus have to on add. the right hand side after you right choose side, the virtual background. Well, that's only if I'm going to add my own image. So there's yeah, no pictures already right there? You don't have any pictures there already? Below your picture. It I'll add. No, I don't. Choose virtual background and it should have all your pictures listed there. Yeah, it's the only ones you add in. Like my one with the shark is the one I added. So that's the one that will show up now. I have like five or six that are there from Zoom. I did not add. They're just no, Zoom. I don't have, nothing's coming up. Well, then you've got to add your own, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, it's a lot easier on an iPad. I had to add all of them. I'm going to try to share this. Enjoyed the program. Joe, that was really good. Mm -hmm. And I have a question for you experts after this is done. You must be talking to Dennis. Go ahead, John. I, I have no idea who you're talking to. I, I may actually be able to participate in the ambient light contest for the first time in okay, like good. 15 or 20 years. Yeah, let me let, let him finish this. Can you see where these did those, Yeah, where did, I, nothing came up like that at all. I mean. Yeah, so I have this whole selection of photos and videos, then you just click on one. Anyone? Yeah, you just whichever one you click on, that's the one it's going to start showing. Let me see. There and you if go. you don't have anything, maybe what you can do is find one and just click the little plus 
and then you can add that photo. You can add a, a, however many you want here, I guess. On the left-hand menu, she has to select virtual background. Okay, right. I've got that. Okay. That's how I got the shark one. It's I went to plus sign and add photo or video, and I went to my photos and I picked the shark one. That's how I got the um, mag one. Right. And I did that today. That's the only one I have on there now. Okay. And if you don't have any there, Tammy, you're going to have to find some on your computer, either on the internet, drag them to your computer, and then hit the plus and go find them. Oh, okay. Or what have you. Okay. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt. <laughs> okay. Trying to learn. <laughs> Hey guys, see you later. Gotta All go. Right, good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you, everybody. Hey, Joe. Dennis, before you and David drop. Yeah, go ahead. For those of you that were shooting all those incredible shrimp pictures, um, what what lens or focal length are you guys using for those? Oh boy. Hey Betsy, I think uh, he's talking to you and Dennis. You shoot a Canon or Nikon? Nikon. Well, I would probably say that most all of mine were taken with the 60 millimeter uh, macro, macro Canon. I'm shooting a Canon 7D Mark mm -hmm. II, and uh, it's a crop sensor, so it translates to roughly about a 90 millimeter on a on a full frame. Okay, is there a lot of cropping involved with it, with something like that, or like would a 105? I've got a crop sensor camera as well. A 105 on a crop sensor is like shooting at 150. Yeah. I wouldn't recommend it. It's going to be very difficult to work with. Oh. I have been using a one. I've used a 100 in the past. It's uh, it's possible. Okay. You get right in there, but since they're all macro lenses, you're still shooting one to one, which means that on mine, I'm shooting pictures of things that are one inch wide because it's a 23 and 23 millimeter uh sensor okay so so about a, a 60 macro would be plenty on a yeah crop the sensor macro, you, got, you want a 60 macro if that's your first macro lens yeah 60 is is really very good it's yeah. the equivalent of a, of a 90 millimeter on a full frame okay so that lens i would shoot stuff like maybe dinner plate size yeah you know, stuff like that okay mm -hmm. the reason i'm asking is i'm shooting i've, I've got a, a 300 millimeter lens I can shoot top side but it's not macro yeah no. but I can focus about six inches away from the subject with it Why and not? I still feel like I want to magnify more oh, no. so, but, but that's probably because it's it's got a different ratio than the macro lenses are you wanting to do this on land mainly or underwater underwater okay yeah 60 60 on land, I would say 105 because the, the distance doesn't matter as much. You can back off a little more with the 105 on the small stuff on land. John, John, what camera are you shooting? Right now it's a D7100. And you have the right court. Who makes it? Nikon. Nikon. Who makes it? I, Nikon. Nikon? Okay. You heard of them? <laughs> uh, off and on. <laughs> Don't say you They're a little company. Japanese, Japanese, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Guys, All right. Well, what you, the crop you, factor you, is, you know, there's different crop factors. It's a 1.5. Yeah. Okay. One point. I mean, they do make a 40 millimeter macro Nikon does to bring it back to a 60 millimeter with the crop, but I haven't seen the best reviews on that lens. So I just still use the 60 and the 105. Yeah. The 60, the 105 seems to be the most popular top side. And I heard people using it underwater. Um, and a lot, and for uh, top water, the what is it? The two hundred is really the optimal, so you're not breathing on your subject. Yeah, the the sixty is very versatile lens for underwater, and everyone uses it. I'll just say yeah. that. Okay, that well, that's what that's the answer I was looking for. Yeah, yeah, it, it's kind of a couch potato lens. Yeah, John. The other thing is that you you do want to get to where you're breathing on the subject. You want to lessen the amount of water between you and the subject. So I understand, yeah. And it makes it more, more fun. Okay, well that's why I was wondering about the 105, but it sounds like that's gonna get me too close plus a lot of vibration. No, 105 would get you further away, but the problem is it's a lot harder to work with because you're looking at such a small area. Yeah. And you do have more water between you and the subject, especially okay. if it's a larger subject, you have to back up really far. 
Right. With the 105 and the crop factor. And so the 60 is much more versatile lens. And even for the yeah, little but, itty bitty shrimp, I mean, some of those things, I probably could have put two of them on my <laughs> fingernail or maybe more. Well, it, yeah, like Dennis said, the 60 will do one to one. So you, yeah. you, know, you can shoot life size onto the sensor, basically. In okay. film days, it'll be life size onto the slide. So if something was the size of a dime, and one to one, you could take a photo of it, and the slide or negative, the dime would be the same size. That's what one of means, basically. So with the, it, with it your has 60 good magnification on the 60, but you do have to be very close. Yeah, John, with the 60 millimeter lens, you have to practice your ninja, ninja skills too, because you're going to be right on top of them. Right. Okay. Really, That's really exactly smaller better. guys like the emperor shrimp. Probably you're also going to want to have, uh, you know, a diopter on top of that because those guys are really tiny. Yeah, those are really little. That would be 105 material because you have more room to play, and you can use a diopter also with that. So. Yeah. Well, you well, can I'll also have... you can crop in on them as yeah. well when you get it into post. Yeah. Excellent. There's plenty of. Well, John, plenty I'm of glad pixels. you turned up. You had some good questions tonight. Yeah. I'm glad you were here. I, I, I can make these Zoom meetings a lot easier than the ones where I got to drive. All right. Then we expect <laughs> to see you every month. All right. Anybody else? All right. Well, Barry, nice seeing you. Nice to meet you. Thanks for letting us use your nice photos you for the um, slideshow for last Philippine show, whenever that was, a couple months ago. Hey, yeah, Barry, no let, let us. Let us know when you want to use the, the Blackwater stuff, and uh, we'll be um, happy to, to help your dive club up there in Oregon. Yeah, I, they were, I don't think they were, they were going to do like a, a picnic, which right now is not a good time to do it, of course. So they've canceled that, and I don't know. I think they're having a virtual meeting, but the, it's not a photography group. So they have different interests. And that's, I, I really prefer this one. I think our meeting might be going on right now. And uh, so I'm with you guys instead, if that tells you anything. Yeah. So, yeah, we're more into photography, actually. Than, you know, around here, they're doing a lot of local dives, and it's cold water, and we quit doing that a couple of years ago. Oh, we accept um, a post uh, memberships outside of Texas. <laughs> I was actually going to ask you about Be that. No, I'm joking. Too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I went to school down there in Seguin, so I was down there for a, a bit. Oh, who is it? And, uh, Seguin? Texas Lutheran? Texas, Texas Lutheran. Yeah, okay. That's that was back in 74. Hmm. So I was down there for a little bit. Okay. Oh, you're a young guy. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> all relative. Uh, it's all, all, in, all in perspective of who you're talking to, I bet. So. What Anyhow, is that in your Yeah, David, I thought you were in the Tetons earlier. What? what? Your background? Oh. oh, me? No, that was. Um, yeah. I'm pointing back here like it was there. Right. That was the Remarkables from New Zealand, from Queenstown. Oh, was it? It looked like the Tetons. No, uh, someone oh, else it? asked me that too. No, it's it's the Remarkables. It's called. Oh, it's pretty. Yep, that's right. My downtown's Queensland. Queensland. What 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 is your background? Harry Frogface or something? Oh, that one. Yeah, that was a snoot. One of my best, my favorite ones for a long time is a, a Harry Frogfish with a. Uh, when I started snooting the first time, I I borrowed Mike's retro and Analow. And uh -huh. I used it for about a day and a half. And um, then I bought one. And so the last yeah. trip, I, I snooted a lot, <laughs> a lot. <laughs> so. That was in Port Aguilera when, you, when it blew its top over there. Port Aguilera, they were Dumaguete, which we prefer to Dumaguete more. Uh, more muck diving there, more, it seemed like more subjects. And the water was about 10 degrees warmer, it felt like. So. Yeah, it was cold. Yeah. Because I, I went yeah, there prior it was in the seventies. I had seventy and, uh, degrees was, in my last dive there, and I was freezing. Yeah, yeah, that's cold. It was chilly. And I asked the dive master what the coldest he ever seen was, and he told me in the degree C, and I calculated out it was sixty nine degrees. And I'm like, oh my god! He goes, yeah, it was terrible. Mm -hmm. Must be a, a, more of a channel goes by there. I guess they got up lungs or something. Yeah, I don't know, but it, yeah. it, it was. Cool. Uh, Dumaguete was Dumaguete was definitely warmer. Well, and, now uh, the, I like the muck diving more. The volcano Pardon? actually blew up while while you were in uh, Puerto Galera. Is that right? It it went off as we went. We left 
Bentangas, where it's at, kind of. The half hour ride over to Port Aguilar, it went off during that ride over wow. the water taxi. Whoa. So we got to the other side, everybody was staring over our head at the funnel cloud. And what are they looking at? So we kind of look around and they go, the volcano. And it's like, oh my God. And wow. it was like, oh shoot, our, uh, Brent, who was doing our class, wasn't there yet. And they shut down the airport uh, the next day. And uh, so we're kind of like, oh, can we get out of here? What's going to happen? Are we going to have this glass? Well, we went diving. And I uh, decided that's probably the best thing to do in the meantime. And uh, he showed up about a day and a half later. And then we went ahead and had our 10-day workshop there. Then went over to, uh, we had another, my wife and I had another week in Dumaguete. It was, it was a nice trip. I'm glad yeah. we got in the water before this all hit. Because uh, the coronavirus was just really getting going in the yeah. news there. And when we left, we couldn't find a mask. Uh, yeah. My wife had brought one just to keep herself on the plane, not even thinking of the coronavirus, but just from getting sick. And so I use, you know, those neck up things you use in, in uh, around yeah. Antelope yes. to keep the sun? Mm -hmm. I used one yeah. of those. That's all I had. And it's not much protection, but it kept me from touching my face, I guess. But yeah, we had to go through Hong Kong on the way back. Nothing. That's what we figured. Yeah, I just booked tickets to Manila for next May for like 770 bucks round trip on United. Oh. Well, that's so a good price. I figured, and it's, you know, United is doing no change fees. If you buy it now, they moved it back to the end of August. And so I figured I'd go for it. And if, you know, we have a vaccine by then, great. If not, I'll push it back or something. Yeah. Where, we went which which resort? What's that? Which resort? I haven't booked a resort yet. I just booked the air oh, okay. on United. Like yeah, I said, we're thinking of the backscatter at Antelau next time with the crystal blue. Okay. Is that, yeah, we, I like, I've learned a lot from Mike. So this will be our sixth trip there. Okay, good. So I, yeah, he's he's been a good teacher. Him and Brent have actually been the, the two best teachers I've had so far. Yeah, Brent seems really good. He has a lot of good videos. I was pretty impressed. Yeah, and he's – do you know Mike? Have you been around Mike yet, David? Yeah, because I was with Dennis on that Philippines trip. Okay. And Mike is, super, Mike is super blunt when he talks yeah. about your stuff. You're doing your film review, you get you can get blown up a lot of times. So he just looked at one of mine and said, you can do better than this and flipped by it. And he was saying <laughs> very, uh, Brent's a little bit – Brent's gentler. <laughs> Yeah, he seems like a pretty laid back nice guy. Yeah, yeah apparently he, he and, and Amy didn't get along very well. Mike and Amy, no, they never did head it off. And uh, it's a shame. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the problem was there. I don't think Amy takes um, negative uh, feedback very well. No, and I think, I think once you're on Mike's bad side, you're on Mike's bad side. Yeah, so, could be. I don't know. Uh,